Our scripture lesson today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. So hear the word of God. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not box like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is the word of the Lord. I thought with our inaugural race in town that we'd examine our own personal race through life. And and let me tell you about the very first marathon. It was the Battle of Marathon, fought back in 490 B.C., when the Persian king Darius launched an attack on Athens. Now, the Athenians were badly outnumbered. So with the odds against them, what they did was they ran the full length of the plain, catching the Persians unorganized. And because of the sudden attack, the Persian troops broke ranks and fled back to their ships. So the Athenians then sent word to Athens, telling of the victory so the city could prepare for the the Persians' fleet attack from the sea. And then the king chose the best runner to take word to Athens. And that runner ran the distance of 26.2 miles. And when he arrived, he said one word and then fell over dead. The word he uttered was Nike, victory. (laughs) So all of you Converse and Adidas wearers, think about that. Now I'm a typical guy attracted to sports. My particular specialty was boxing, where I was <clears throat> 17 and 1. And uh, you do a lot of running in preparation for fights. We'd run stadium stairs, the beach sand, often spent a lot of time on tracks. And one of the boxers out of our gym was actually the silver medalist for the 84 Olympics fighting for Mexico. And, and in a couple of churches, I've had some folks who were just on the verge of going to the Olympics. One was a swimmer who missed the Olympics by one-tenth of a second. Another guy missed being in the sprints by three-tenths of a second. And I've always found it interesting that the Apostle Paul uses athletic imagery so often in the Bible. I think there is a correlation to life lessons through athletics, like the fact that there is an end goal, a finish line, not to mention instructions on how to win the race of life, accomplished through training and in a focused mindset. I heard about a gentleman who used to run with the nine-time gold medalist Carl Lewis, and they always raced together, and Carl Lewis would barely beat him out each time. So he grew up thinking, wow, I'm slow. (laughs) No, (laughs) you're actually racing against the fastest man of all time. Um, You're not slow at all. But, But I bring this up because sometimes we compare ourselves to others and their race, their skill set, their course. And I don't think we should compete with the wrong opponents. You know, we'll, we'll compare ourselves to others, but they might have had family setbacks or abusive parents or a cancer journey or poverty or sinful addictions that are not part of your race through life. Or maybe they don't have barriers that you do. In Hebrews 12.1, it states that we're to run the race that is marked out for us. You see, God has a plan for our lives. And while it might intersect with other people's races, yours is uniquely your own. Besides, in Romans 14, 4, it says, Who are you to judge the servant of another? 
stand or fall, he will, and the Lord is able to make him stand. We tend to look at others and and judge them. I think of the Apostle Peter. He's being restored from the three denials, and as Jesus says, tend my sheep and feed my lambs and follow me, Peter says, well, what about him, the Apostle John? The Lord says, what is that to you? You follow me. Each one of us, we have our own unique race. And while it is a solitary journey, we do not run it alone. First, we have an audience cheering us on. In in chapter 11 of Hebrews, it talks about the saints that have gone before us. And there they are, the cloud of witnesses, encouraging us as they pass the baton of faith to us, and we now run with it. Some of us, we have biblical characters who are our role models. Uh, Many of us, we have spiritual mentors in our lives, the people who inspired us on our faith journey. And and believe it or not, we have folks that we'd like to emulate, and there are folks that are going to be inspired by you, folks that you can emulate in your faith. You can inspire by your walk with God. And the fact of the matter is, friends, there are no sidelined Christians. All of us are involved in the race of life. I mean, sometimes we tend to dismiss ourselves. Well, you know, I'm not all that gifted. Or, you know, I had that bad season in my life. I I, I don't know that I'm ever able to. No, you haven't been dismissed. You haven't been disqualified. God expects you to run the race of faith. And by the way, I want to tell you who your competition is. It's not the Methodists, it's not the Catholics, it's the Baptists, all right? I'm kidding. It's this secular society that seems to be pushing Jesus out right now. It's the preeminence of the self that is always fighting for my will instead of thy will. It is the evil influences that are opposed to all that God esteems. We have some foes that we're running against and fighting against. And and you can't help but ask, but what about my setbacks and failures? You know, I'm a tennis fan, and I remember Monica Seles. She was a a professional tennis player, and at one particular point in her career, she was winning 98% of all of her matches, dominating the field. And then, in one particular match, a crazed fan comes out of the stands, stabs her in the back, right in the shoulder blade, so her career's over, right? Wrong. She puts herself into some rigorous workout programs and was able to regain to the top of of, of her ability again. And, And you read stories like that and you go, wow, people who won't give up, they're so inspiring. And perseverance, it's a big part of our faith. The ability to push through and never give up. I mean, quitters aren't much of an inspiration, are they? You never look at somebody who quit and say, wow, I want to be like them. It just doesn't happen. And I'll say that occasionally somebody will come into my office and they'll have a tale of horrible abuse that they've endured. And they're having trouble figuring out how to overcome and go forward in life. And, and, And I'll usually tell them this. I'll say, you know what? You have a free pass for the rest of your life. You tell your story, and everybody in society is going to understand why you have a barrier. But I'd like to invite you to lean on God. Bring him into your situation and let him heal you. Let him bring about forgiveness. Let him set a new course for your life. Because then you could be freed from the bad behavior of whoever did that to you, and you can also be an inspiration to others. And and I tell you this because... All of us are teammates in this faith contest. Actually, you can do a lot for the Lord if you don't care who gets the credit. I bring this up because how many athletes, they'll score a touchdown or make you know, a home run, and they do this, point to themselves, you know, I'm the man, or they'll demean their opponents. Ah. Okay, you scored a touchdown, big deal. All right. You watch other athletes, and they point to heaven, And at the victory speech, they talk about their teammates that helped them win. They seem to understand that we're all in this together. 
You know, there's a famous story about the Special Olympics where the contestants were going to run the 100-yard dash. And the gun goes off, and they all start running. And about 15 yards in, one of the runners slips and falls and then starts crying. And to everybody's utter dismay, the entire field stops running, and they turn around, and they come back, and they lift this girl up, and then they put themselves arm in arm, and they finish the race together. And, and I like the story because really, I think that's how you and I are supposed to go through the race of life. Not trying to get ahead of the rest of the field, but come to the aid of those who have tumbled in their journey and help them get up and finish. You know, I'm one of those competitive guys. I'm back in the old style church. Uh, we used to have a way of measuring how we're doing. You see, in the sanctuary above the door would be an oak plaque. And it would have three sets of numbers. Attendance, giving, and decisions made for Christ. And that way you could see how you were doing. Measure if indeed you are winning the race. But you know what? I think the Special Olympics actually teach us it's not about winning. It's not about numbers. It's about participating. It's about being the best that you can be. Not comparing yourself to that other church or that other person who seems to be so much gifted. But you and God, you're on a journey together. And you're giving him your all and you're doing your best. And God will squeeze more out of you if you allow him into your life. But to win the race, it requires the right attitude. I was reading in, in Acts 4, and Paul's preaching in Lystra. But some of his enemies come along, and they get the crowd all up against Paul, and they stone him and drag him out of the city dead. So what happens? Paul gets up, comes back to life, and he goes back into the city to preach some more. I mean, even the threat of violence couldn't keep Paul away. He had a passion. He had a drive that couldn't be quenched. As I'm reading this story and thinking about it, I'm wondering, how passionate are we in our race? You know, Marlon Brando, he had that famous line, I could have been a contender. And Jerry Shirley explains the difference between a pretender and a contender. A pretender is concerned about image. A contender with substance. A pretender settles for mediocrity. A contender strives for excellence. A pretender quits in difficulty. A contender grows through difficulty. Contenders, they're goal-driven. They're willing to compete, to fight the good fight for the hearts and souls of those around us. It was Vince Lombardi who once said, winning is a habit, and so is losing. Winners, they have a plan. Losers, they have an excuse. Winners say, let me do it. Losers say, not in my job description. Winners see the possibility. Losers see the difficulties. Winners say, look and see how big my God is. Losers say, look and see how big my problem is. And something about winners is they're always in training. And that's where you and I get involved. Spiritually, in our devotional lives, when we're reading the Bible and praying and meeting with the Lord, this is our training session. This is where the Lord prepares us and empowers us and fills us and sends us forth into the race. It's a training moment. You know, athletes create room to grow and advance their skills. In, in our bulletin, I, I, I write, you and I are supposed to be advancing every day in our faith, increasing in our ministry with Jesus moving through us. You know, winners, they're willing to pay the price. And I think sometimes we fail to see the sacrifice that athletes make. And I think sometimes we fail to appreciate the devotion that many Christians engage in when we see the fruit of their ministries. And really, the value of your dream, it's determined by how much you're willing to pay. Michelangelo, did you know he wasn't the best painter of his time? And he had some personal setbacks. He had a bad back. He had a sinus condition, and yet he laid on his back painting a ceiling for nearly two years till he completed the Sistine Chapel. No one else was willing to do that. And now all the great painters of his day are forgotten in obscurity. 
But who do we remember? Michelangelo, who made the sacrifice. You know, for the basketball fans, Larry Bird would shoot 100 free throws after practice. I was reading how Kobe Bryant would go without sleep all night long, staying in the gym, practicing. Causes you to wonder, what kind of effort are we putting in to our race? And this leads us to training. You know, the Bible says that you and I should do squats and work our biceps. It's in Hebrews 12, 12. Strengthen your feeble knees and weak hands. At least that's how I interpret it, okay? <laughs> and, and really, if you're going to be in a race, you have to watch what you eat. You have to stretch. You have to strengthen. You, you have to get your sleep. You need to be focused, study the route. And you have to win the mental game. You kind of need to push yourself. You know, in the NFL, back in the day, there was a running back called Walter Payton. He played, played for the Chicago Bears. And he was better than everybody else. And people wanted to know his secret. And they'd say, well, can we train with you? And he'd say, sure, come on. And then after a grueling practice, he would go and he'd run up a hill with a straight-up incline. And great professional athletes would try to work out with him, and they ended up losing their lunch. They couldn't do what he did. Then they started to understand why he was so much better. And the word for discipline in the Greek literally means to strike under the eye, insinuating that self-control could make us black and blue. That's the kind of involvement that should go into our discipline. I think of the Hebrews 12, 4 statement. In the battle against sin, you have not resisted to the shedding of blood. That's how serious we're called to take our faith. Well, in marathons, there's a moment called the wall. And I think it strikes runners around mile 17 where the body says, I can't go on anymore. And boy, don't we know that wall in life. You know, when we feel, and feel like we can't take another step, the pain's too excruciating, the, the challenge before us too daunting. And we'd rather just stop. But here's where, if we press on, not only do we see what we're capable of, that's where the Lord meets us. That's where God comes alongside of us and empowers us and gets us through. When you hit that wall, that's the time to cry out to God. You know, I was asking runners about their training regiment, and, and, and I was surprised to learn that many of them, they don't run the full 26 miles in practice. Rather, they'll do 20 miles in training and then test the body and the mind and their character as if part of the race is uncharted territory, a part of themselves that's to be discovered. And I like that. Because I feel that's the same with our faith. You know, often we try to control everything. We want to know all contingencies. And then we're willing to go forward. But that's not what faith is about. Faith is willing to step forward into uncharted territory, being guided by the Holy Spirit and trusting God, leaning on Him. I guess what I'm saying is you can't be a control freak and a powerful Christian. Because Christ is going to ask you to go places you've never been before. Forgive people you'd never be willing to forgive. To care about others who have actually never been part of your, your perspective. Well, 1 Timothy chapter 4 says bodily discipline profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things now and in the life to come. And we have some spiritual exercises that as Christians we're expected to do. We're expected to be reading the Bible so that we know the will of God. We're expected to have prayer time so that we can create a relationship with God. We're expected to interact with other Christians because we're the body of Christ, his, his children, brothers and sisters to one another. We're expected to go to church where we worship. I think the offering plate is where we sometimes get measured. And obviously, mission to others, so that we're not just self-focused. 
I've come to realize that mature Christianity involves us being willing to extend grace to those who don't deserve it, taking care of the offering plate and spreading the gospel, being involved in missions and and willing to talk about your faith to other people. Now, I was talking to some other pastors about Bible reading, and, you know, I confidently asserted that I uh, read the Bible through every year. And as I was feeling pretty proud of myself, one guy said, only once a year? You know, in 1976, the University of Indiana won the national title. And when interviewed about their success, Coach Knight said, the will to succeed is important. But what is more important is the will to prepare. And and this is where, again, it gets personal. Preparing for our race through life with God. You know, again, the scripture says, throw off everything that hinders us in the race of our faith. And if you'll notice, runners, they'll get up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning before work to get their training in. And I remember having to get rid of training partners because they'd want to party after the workout. Or for some of them, they just wanted to do the minimum and not the extra reps that made you better. I'd like to suggest that in our faith, that we need to prioritize our habits, examine our relationships, and, and think about our preparations. Because if people are not inspiring our walk with God, then actually we need to gravitate away from them towards those who are going to encourage our faith. We need to address whatever distracts and hinders us from God. Today, 2,000 runners ran, probably most of them for fitness sake. But you and I, our goal is to please God as we do the race of life. And Benjamin Disraeli, he said this, the secret to success is for a man to be ready for his time when it comes. Are you ready for those God moments when they appear? Are you ready when somebody's hurting to speak the word, to let the Holy Spirit move through you? Because those missed opportunities, you know, the destiny of other people's soul is on the line. Second Timothy 4.2 says, Be ready in season and out of season. I remember when I was at seminary, I'm standing with a bunch of kids, and this man comes along, grabs the kid's bike, and starts riding off. Well, I happened to be in shape at the time. So I ran after him, tracked him down, got the bike back. And I got to be the boy's hero for a day. But you know what? I like what the Peace Corps commercial says. If you're not doing something with your life, it doesn't matter how long it is. And this leads us to our goal. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have finished the course. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. And friends, finishing the race is important for the Christian. You know, it's sad when you read through the Bible how many biblical characters did not finish their relationship with God off so well. And truly, how many of us, we know Christians, who ah, quit going to church. Hey, they still believe, but somehow God's not that driving force in their lives anymore. And what are we preparing for? Heaven. We're preparing for that time when you and I will live together forever with the Lord. But friends, it's not only about that time. We get to experience him now. You know, we don't want to be so heavenly minded that we're not earthly good. C.S. Lewis once commented, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither. There's a famous story of a man asking a laborer, what are you doing? And he said, can't you tell I'm laying bricks? He went to another laborer and said, what are you doing? And the workman said, I'm building a cathedral. Watch your perspective as you go through every day. Is it the whole hum every day, or do you understand the tapestry, the eternal significance that your life has? Friends, I want you to keep your eyes on the ultimate goal, because a life without purpose is a race without a finish line. And you and I were to press on towards the mark, the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. The he- heaven is the reward, but so is a changed life, saved from sin's penalties and saved 
from sin's dominance over you. But, but what about yesterday's defeats? You know, too many of us, we, we hang our heads in shame because of something that happened in the past, or we hang our hats in pride because of something we accomplished. Friends, that's yesterday. And today is a new leg of the race of life with God. And I want you to run your life with winning in mind, focused on the goal. I want you to understand the the eternal significance your life has. And how do we keep that? It's as simple as keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Eyes on Jesus keeps us focused on what we're about. Because ultimately, in the race of life, the greatest reward is a relationship with the living God who's running alongside of you every day. Well, I close. The Roman Emperor Nero, he commanded that all soldiers of his army that claimed Christianity were to be executed. So Vespasian, a centurion of Nero's army, he received the decree and summoned all soldiers to appear before him. Any who cling to the faith of the Christians will be executed. Now let him step forward who claims Christ. And immediately, 40 wrestlers stepped forward two paces. And Vespasian was heartsick, and he tried to persuade them to denounce their faith. They wouldn't do it. Well, it was the dead of winter, and he commanded that they be stripped of their clothes in order to march out on a lake, frozen over in ice, in freezing temperatures. He said, the fire will be waiting for any who will denounce his false faith. That was his parting words. Well, as they marched away, they sang, 40 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, wrestling for the crown of life, wrestling for the victory. And all night they sang while Vespasian waited by the fire until in the wee hours of the morning, one frozen naked soldier crept toward the fire to denounce his Lord. Then the singing was heard again. 39 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, wrestling for the crown of life, wrestling for the victory. Well, this patient, he looked out in the darkness, and off came his helmet, and he laid down his shield, and out into the cold he went. And then singing could be heard again above the whisper of the wind. Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, wrestling for the crown of life, wrestling for the victory. You know, the Greek word victory is Nike. And in 1 John 5, 4, it states, this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Friends, let's put our faith into practice and win this race with and for God.